Why are silver-plated antiques so underrated? This is a question I've been wondering to myself for a while now. Silver and gold plating has been practiced as a way of adorning objects for eons. And gold plating is so much more valued. And why is that? Looking to answer these questions, we're going to delve into some old tomes, as well as explore the different methods. And then we're going to have a look at a bunch of silver plated objects here in the set. And then we're also going to visit Artur Aminov and his shop Galerie Donner here in Helsinki, because it's, I mean, it's full of beautiful and interesting things, but he's also an expert in antique silver. And that makes his shop the perfect destination. I'm Lassi and welcome to Artifacts. Historically, gold and silver were the most important precious metals. These materials have some special qualities to them, like gold doesn't oxidize. Gold and silver are also very pliable, that makes it easier to work with than other metals, like copper for example. So making things out of gold and silver is actually just easier. But not everyone could afford objects made out of gold and silver. Because these materials were so much more expensive, they tried to make a little bit go a long way. One of the ways to do this was taking another material and coating it. Let's talk about gilding first. Gilt bronze objects are some of the most valuable antiques around, like this ormolu mounted table from St. Petersburg around 1810s or 20s. And here at Galerie Donner we have a lot more examples of this kind. Gilt bronze, or bronze doré as the French would have called it, is the foremost way of achieving a golden object without actually making the object entirely out of gold. Making an object entirely out of gold would have been mind-bogglingly expensive and maybe not that practical as gold is quite malleable and pliable and soft. Gilding, therefore, is a perfect answer to the problem. D'Alembert and Diderot in the Encyclopedia from 1751 actually describe in meticulous detail these different techniques of gold plating and silver plating. The technique known as ormolu translates to ground gold. This process involves taking gold filings and mixing them with mercury. This results in something known as a gold mercury amalgam. This paste-like amalgam was applied to the object with the help of brush and mercury nitrate. Application entails dipping the brush in the nitrate solution, followed by the amalgam, and then brushing over the bronze surface until the entire surface is fully coated. The application is followed by the heating stage. The object, after drying, would be exposed to a charcoal fire. The heat of the fire would volatilize the mercury in the amalgam, evaporating it and adhering the gold to the metal surface. Now, if that sounds dangerous, that's because it actually was really dangerous. Toxic mercury vapors were a true health hazard. It is estimated, for example, that the gilding of the dome of St. Isaac's Cathedral in St. Petersburg, Russia, caused the deaths of 60 gilders. The injurious effects of this practice actually led the French authorities to banning it in around 1830. You can see gilt bronze ormolu from later times as well, because in other countries they didn't ban the process. And most often you would find this in Asian artifacts like bodhisattvas, like statues and that sort of thing. Aside from gold plating, silver plating was also very popular. And it was done for much the same reasons. Silver was not available to just about everyone because of the price. So they would of course take a bit of silver and make it go a long way. Silver was less expensive than gold and a bit sturdier, which allowed people to make actually objects out of solid silver. Even wealthy households would have had uh, silver-plated objects like silver-plated cutlery aside from solid silver cutlery. Now, what is interesting about silver-plating techniques is that almost nobody really cares about them. 
A quick look at literature, mostly in Swedish and Finnish for me, maybe some English books, and the internet, reveals that there's a, quite a bit of confusion about these topics and they're not really talked about anywhere in a clear way. According to Wikipedia, the first silver plating method is called Sheffield Plate from around 1740s. And that is a process where you take uh, two sheets of silver and one plate of copper and then fuse those together with the copper on the inside. But this can't be right. I mean, they had made silver plated objects before 1740. The most likely method that they used is called amalgam silvering. So that's basically the same method uh, that we described earlier. This is sometimes called fire silvering or mercury silvering. Around the same time as Sheffield played in around 1740s, the French came up with a method, Archa Archer, hacked silver. And this really, this method really sounds quite strange, but it's basically just a bunch of uh, silver foil adhered to metal with heat. D'Alembert and Diderot described the method in the following way. You begin by polishing a brass object. Then annealing is called for. Annealing entails heating the object in a certain way. You then sand the surface, followed by yet again heating, after which the object is plunged into water, forming an uneven surface on the object. The fifth step is the piece de resistance, hacking. Cut. Hacking essentially just means taking different knives to the metal and cutting lines, sort of hatchings, onto the surface. The main point of this exercise is to sort of score the surface of the metal so the silver foil will adhere better. The piece is then blued, which means heating it until it reaches a certain temperature and turns blue. After bluing the piece, it is attached to a rod or frame, depending on the shape, which allows it to be kept at the right temperature during the next and seventh step, which is called charging. Charging entails laying leaves of silver onto the hot piece. They then fuse onto the metal. After charging, the piece is burnished or polished and then rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. More and more silver leaves are applied and burnished and heated uh, this piece until it reaches the desired thickness of the silver plating. D'Alembert and Diderot, they describe that you can do sort of 60 layers. Now, why does nobody talk about this method? I mean, they sort of do, like for example in Sweden, but there's a quite a specific reason for that. In English literature, the technique is referred to as French plating, though you quite rarely see this term used. A Google search for French plating gives somewhat uh, culinary results. The main problem seems to be that identifying and telling apart the different silver plating methods, or gold plating methods for that matter, seems to be extremely difficult. Professional antique dealers like Artur Aminov, they rely on years of experience and even they can't really tell you if, the, if some piece is actually of some other method or another. It's, um... It's difficult to do it in a sort of exact way. It's more like the Germans say, it's a fingerspitzgefühl. It's on the top of your fingers. You know, there's something wrong with this. I don't think this is old. Now, if you can't tell the difference between the different methods, then why talk about it? The reason that they talk about Archer in Sweden, for example, is down to pretty much just one thing. They are marked, so that's, that, that's, that's, uh, that helps a lot. The reason that most people ever talk about Archer uh, or French plating is because an object has been manufactured in a certain time and in a certain style, namely Louis XV style or Rococo style, because that is the time when this technique was mostly used. It's anyway quite interesting that gold foil was also used, or Archer. I mean, I have heard nowhere anyone ever mention this technique before. In time, pretty much all of these different methods were overtaken by electroplating, starting from around the 1840s or so, when it was developed. Electroplating uses electrolysis to deposit a metal onto another metal surface. You can usually distinguish electroplating from other methods because the object is submerged in the electrolyte. 
That means that the plating goes all around the object. Many objects you can just see that they are not gilt on the back side. So it's also a technical question. If you have this big um, wall brackets and so on, they're, they're always, you wouldn't spend the money on, on, on making the gilding on the back side. And then there's nickel silver, known by so many names I don't know all of them. It's actually not silver at all, it's just a sort of alloy of different metals, which sort of looks a lot like silver. Sometimes it's called white metal, but also alpaca, new silver, German silver or Britannia metal, which also contains antimony, whatever that is. I mean, regional varieties are a plenty. This actually makes a lot of sense as a base metal with silver plating, because when it's silver colored and the plating wears off, it doesn't really look all that bad when you compare it with like a copper base. The name that is used is often EPNS, electroplated nickel silver. And actually, most of the silver plated objects that you see around you are made using this method. It's pretty inexpensive to produce. And that's where we get to the first question in the very beginning. Why are silver plated objects so underrated? I think it really comes down to price and by extension, appreciation. You know, if it's not real silver or gold, it must be masquerading as silver and gold, therefore making it sort of fake and therefore worthless. A lot of people really seem to think like this and this is uh, reflected in auction results and museum collections as well. Electroplated pieces can be truly fabulous as well. In Finland and Sweden, the same silversmiths that would produce high quality silver objects would also make silver plated objects and they would be exactly the same just made out of this different metal. The craftsmanship itself is on the very same level as their silver merchandise. And then there's also the French company Christophe, which produced extremely high quality silver plated objects with electroplating. And we have a small clip of that down below, so if you want to see it, please do. When you consider that a lot of these silver plated objects, if they're definitely, if they're really old ones, the technique of manufacture was so involved, took so many more steps than just making a silver object, combined with the fact that it was also much more hazardous to make them in many cases, that in and of itself, for me, makes it so much more compelling and interesting to look at these objects than just normal silver objects. Fine gilt bronze objects are in a total world of their own. I mean, they were made as luxury items, they were made really sort of like high status items, and that is reflected in their quality. And I do like them myself as well. And you could say I am guilty as charged. <clears throat> but they could essentially be the same object. But the other one is made with silver plating and the other one made with gold plating. And the silver plated ones would garner so much less appreciation than the gold plated ones. And this is a case where the markets fail to recognize the cultural historical value of an object that is exactly as interesting as its more luxurious counterpart. Thanks for watching and do you have silver plated objects? Do you have any questions? Do you want to comment? Did I get something wrong? Did I miss something? Probably did. Do you have suggestions for future videos? I would love to hear about it. Just please just comment below and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.